time prophecy for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. If you're still a little confused about that, I know that they're taping this video, taping it. You can get a copy of it. I think it's up on Facebook. Uh, Facebook, sorry about that. YouTube. And that could be something that you can go back and listen to. But I'll summarize it, and that's a good news for us, about what we learned there. For there were two main things there in this passage. The first is it's a time period. What's the time period? 2,300 days. And then there's an event. And what's the event? The cleansing of the sanctuary. So if we look at it this way, up on the screen you see that the 2,300 days is highlighted in yellow. That is the time period. Now, instead of that time period being highlighted, the event is highlighted. Then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. And it may seem difficult to say, what are we talking about? Well, it wasn't difficult for Daniel. Daniel had an idea what that meant because as a Jew growing up around the sanctuary, he understood what that was all about. Well, you say, I'm not a Jew and I didn't grow up around the sanctuary. And even if I am a Jew, I didn't grow up around the sanctuary. So I don't know what that's all about. But the good news is that the Bible has that information clearly spoken of in the Old Testament. So let me remind you what we studied about as we went through this. We want to understand what the cleansing of the sanctuary was, what did it mean. And going back in the Old Testament, we can find that out. You will remember that God said in, to Moses, let them make me a sanctuary that I might dwell among them in Exodus chapter 25, verse 8. So imagine today that you're a million Israelites coming out of Egypt, marching along, escaping from captivity in Egypt, gone through the Red Sea that parted miraculously for you, you came out on the other side, and you're wandering in a desert, quite literally, in a desert, and God comes along and says, I want to get better acquainted with you. Now that sounds good, doesn't it? He'd already worked all these miracles of the plagues and everything else, and here they're coming out of Egypt, and they're in the wilderness, and he says, I want you to build a house for me. I want you to build a sanctuary for me. Why? Because I want to dwell there. And God was serious. He wasn't playing games. He said, I want you to build this sanctuary. Now, it had to be portable, you understand, because they were on the move all the time. And so he told them how to build it. He described how to build it. The Bible calls it the sanctuary. And it was there for a reason. They were out in a desert. There's a lot of sand at the desert. Something like there's a lot of sand at the beach. And you know what? I remember as a kid playing in a sandbox. Now, I don't know if anybody plays in sandboxes anymore. But I learned as a kid, some of my teachers would use sandbox as a way of teaching me things. Well, God was doing that with the Israelites. He was using a great big sandbox to teach them a lesson about the plan of salvation. And so in the tabernacle, he taught them about the plan of salvation. Let me review it with you quickly. A man would come to the sanctuary, or even a woman would come to the sanctuary, and they would confess their sin, whatever it might be. Maybe they got angry with their neighbor. And God tells us that we shouldn't be angry with our neighbors. And it was a sin for them to do that. Or maybe they did something even worse than that. But they came to the sanctuary, and there they uh, would come and offer a sacrifice to atone for their sin. They'd bring a lamb. And that lamb would be brought, and they would bring it here to the, around the area of the uh, altar of burnt sacrifice, and then they would have to slay that lamb. They would have to slay it themselves. The blood would then be taken from that lamb. I know this sounds cruel, but understand, God was trying to illustrate something important. That sin causes death. He wasn't kidding. Sin causes death. The Bible tells us the wages of sin is death. So he was teaching them that by this act. The blood would then be taken by the priest, who would go into the holy place of the sanctuary. He would come up to this altar 
of incense here and he would offer the blood and sprinkle the blood there as an atonement for that person's sin. It was called the atonement or atoning for sin. These other instruments here, all of articles of furniture, all have special meanings, meanings that I'm not going to go into today. That was the daily service. Now, people didn't always have a sin that they needed to come and confess like that. But every day in the morning and in the evening, there would be a sacrifice offered for the people in general, reminding them of Jesus' sacrifice. That took place every day. In our study, we also went and looked at this number or time prophecy, and in doing so, we found something amazing. Oh, I wish I could take the time to review it tonight, because if you're here for the first time, you're going to say, what in the world is that man talking about? But I want you to know that there's a time prophecy in the Bible that clearly proved itself as being accurate. It is this prophecy about the 2300 days. And we found that part of that prophecy spoke about 490 years. Now, the 200,300 200, days we found in Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 6 actually represents a day for a year. So one year for every day in that prophetic uh, sequence. We found that in 457 B.C. there was a decree that Daniel said would go out to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem. Gabriel the angel told him that information and said, when that happens, you'll know that that's the beginning of the prophecy, 457 B.C. And he said, 69 years later, the Messiah will come. And we identified that, that the Messiah was the anointed one, or Jesus Christ, the Savior, and it took, he was anointed at his baptism, 483 years later, right on time, just as the New Testament says, very uh, several times that just on time Jesus did this and Jesus did that. Time was important to God because he wanted to know that this time would help us to have confidence in him that God knew before it even happened that it would happen. Amen. He then told us that in the middle of this time of one week that remained, or the 69 weeks, there were 70 weeks, he said in the middle of that week the Messiah would be cut off. That represented the cross. That took place on AD 31. And then he said that there was 70 years given for God's people, who at that time were the Jews. And he said that they would be given that time to make a decision to serve me the way I'm asking God, God wanted them to serve and so, when that time was done, the message not only uh, was there for the Jews, but it was also for everybody in the world, including the Gentiles, that did not grow up as God's people in, the, in that particular sense. That time prophecy, 2,300 days or 2,300 years, also told us that the sanctuary would be cleansed. And you're saying, are you ever going to tell us what the sanctuary cleansing is? Yes, I'm glad you asked. I'm going to tell you right now about that. Because what we've been talking about all this time is the service that took place on a daily basis. Once a year, the high priest went into the most holy place of the sanctuary. Where am I talking about? Right over here. In the most holy place of the sanctuary, the priest could go there only once a a year. It was the most sacred part of the temple. On this most important day of the Jewish year, it was called the Day of Atonement. Remember we said that this was making an atonement for sin, but there was a day specifically called the Day of Atonement when he went in before the Ark of the Covenant, which represented the throne of God. Just to give you a, some clarity in relationship to that, when the sanctuary was first constructed out there in the wilderness, there was a cloud that would hang over the children of Israel during the day, keeping the sun off of them because it was blazing hot out there. At night, it would be radiating fire because it was cold at night, and the fire would give off heat. It would also <coughs> guide the children of Israel when they needed to move. And that cloud was there. It was God in that cloud. But when the sanctuary was constructed, 
and he had a place to dwell, God actually came down as a bright light called the Shekinah glory, and he hovered over the ark because it represented his throne. Look it up in the Bible. It's there. That's what happened. This was God's throne when the children of Israel had the sanctuary and when they moved from place to place, they had to do it very carefully and very reverently. God would remove his presence, the sanctuary could move, and then he would come back into the sanctuary later. That was his dwelling place. On this day, it was special. The priest didn't go into there except on that one day. Inside the Ten Commandments, the law of God was located. Because you see, what was taking place on the Day of Atonement was a representation of what God wants us to understand today. Amen. Above the ark right here was the mercy seat because God is a merciful and caring God. Between the, him, there were two angels on either side, the hovering angels that... Um, that are associated with God, representing the angels around God's throne. Between the angels was the glory that I talked to you about, representing His very presence. Inside the ark were the two tables of stone with the Ten Commandments, written, yes, by the very hand of God. God Himself wrote those, those commandments on the tables of stone. Also, there was Aaron's rod that budded miraculously, and a pot of manna, both to remind the people of God's miraculous care in their wilderness wandering for 40 years. When the high priest went into the sanctuary once a year, the work that he was doing there was the work of atonement. Or we could say it this way, if you understand the word atonement, break it up this way, at one minute. It was the time when God was bringing His people back in to one with Him. It was a day of judgment. It was called the day of the cleansing of the sanctuary. Why was it called the cleansing of the sanctuary? Because symbolically, when the blood of the slain lambs was carried into the sanctuary, day after day after day, the sanctuary was symbolically becoming polluted by the sins of the people. Now remember, this is all symbolism. God was illustrating for what was happening. But God was serious about it because He wanted them to understand that sin is serious. But He also wanted them to understand that Jesus, the Messiah, was going to come and He was going to take sin away. Amen. Is that good news? Yeah. So once a year, he would illustrate this in a very real sense. He wanted them to understand that all those sins that accumulated in the sanctuary symbolically needed to be removed from there and done away with because Jesus was illustrating the fact that one day he's going to come again and sin will be done away with forever. That's what the cleansing of the sanctuary represented in terms of its overall emphasis. But it was a day of judgment because you needed to be ready. Because if you weren't ready, there was a problem. Every Israelite had to examine their heart. They knew, they, they knelt there and they said, God, wash me clean. God, I give you my evil temper. I give you my bitterness. I give you my lust. I give you up my jealousy. Every Israelite didn't, who did not participate in that service was cut off from the camp of Israel. He was cast out. He or she was cast away. I don't know any record of that ever happening. Apparently, they took it seriously. But that, were the, that was the instructions they were given. They were judged. They were separated if they failed. The cleansing of the sanctuary in the Old Testament illustrated something that is to happen before Jesus Christ comes again. There was the daily service and there was the yearly service. One representing what Jesus would do on this earth when he came and offered his life on Good Friday on the cross. The other representing something else that the Bible is making clear. Amen. The yearly service represented what Jesus is doing today. Let me illustrate that for you more clearly. 
The Bible in Daniel says for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. It refers to the judgment that takes place just before the end of the world. The Day of Atonement was an illustration of God's judgment before He comes. So if we go back to our time prophecy, now hang on to what I'm sharing with you, but the Bible is abundantly clear about this. The Bible said there would be 2,300 years. We know the prophecy is accurate. We it know it's clear because the Bible actually gives us the date of Christ's baptism, the date of His death on the cross. We know that it was so significant that Luke the doctor gave us those dates. If it right in where they're supposed to in the prophecy, we don't have to get confused or uh, misunderstand that part of the prophecy. So when the prophecy we are told begins with a degree, decree to rebuild Jerusalem and to restore it to God's people in 457 B.C., all we have to do is add 2,300 days to that time and we come up with the date of 1844. And if you alive in 1844? That tells me that 1844 is behind me because when I look at the calendar, my calendar tells me it's 2019. What in the world does that mean to you and to me? Look at Revelation chapter 14 verse 7 again. And let's see if we can understand what it is that God is trying to tell us. If you and I read that verse again, I'd like you to read it off the screen because I want you to get that. But look at it in chapter 14 in your Bible as well. I want you to see I'm not making this up. It's clear. It's in your Bible. This is what it says. The angel that first of all in verse 6 said that the message of the everlasting gospel needed to go out. Then he said this. Read it with me please. Fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment has come. The Bible is telling us something. I told you these pieces are connected together. God was helping us to understand that the time of judgment that was spoken of by Daniel, given a specific date, He comes along later and says, the hour when we get to the time of the end has come. The judgment has come. He wants us to know it has come. The time has already arrived. Right. It's here. That's what the Bible is telling us. Now you're saying, uh oh, what are we talking about now? Stay with me. <laughs> Daniel said 2,300 days would be until the cleansing of the sanctuary or the judgment. And the angel tells John the time has already come. Not when John was there, but when the angel goes through out to share his message. Well, the angel is giving that message. I'm standing here telling you, and I'm not an angel. I want you to know that. But I am a messenger just as you are a messenger. If you go and bring a friend, you're a messenger. If you tell them about what the Bible says, you're a messenger for God. God gave Daniel a time message for the end of the world time, and John got the updated version. In John, he was given a general time, and I mean, Daniel was given a general time, and John is given a specific understanding that when these things are happening around in the world, we know that we have reached the time of the end. So we know from Daniel <coughs> chapter 2, as we studied on, the, on Thursday, that we're living at the time of the end because of that vision. By the way, all those animals that I pointed out in the beginning tonight, they help us to see it even more clearly. But that's another study. John has the updated version in Revelation reminding us that the hour of judgment has come. Let me explain this to you now and make it a little clearer. Revelation is a book of eternal choices. We have to choose between God and His enemy, the beast. We have to choose between sin and obedience to God. Every day, we have to make decisions. Just being here tonight was a decision you made. It could be a life-changing decision. Your presence here, and I would say a good decision at that. But trust me, Satan did not want you to be here tonight. But the Lord helped you to choose wisely. We make decisions all the time. When Revelation talks about judgment, it is referring to a review of all the choices that we have made in our lives. This is what the Bible tells us. 
I want you to follow along with me because it's amazing, but also very clear. Revelation describes details about the judgment. Daniel predicts when and where. Revelation tells us about details. Daniel says when and where. It tells us that the judgment determines what reward that Jesus gives every individual at his second coming. How do I know? Look at what Revelation 22 says. My reward, Jesus is speaking, my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. That would be really scary. <laughs> if it wasn't for what we talked about last night. Amen. So stay with me. Because I don't want you to miss everything worrying about this because there's a solution to what I would see as a problem. But Jesus simply said, my reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. Jesus clarified this, to point, this point with his disciples. In Matthew 16, he said, for the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father and with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. So Jesus says this in Revelation, but he already said it to his disciples in Matthew that that is the way it would be. In chapter 20 of Revelation, we find these words, I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. You know what? They didn't have computers in those days, but God has a way to keep records. And it's going to make your apple look silly. God has a way of keeping track of everything. That's what the Bible tells us. He has a way of doing that. And in this passage it says, The dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Here is something the Bible calls books, and those books were opened before the whole universe. From those books, God decides the reward He gives to every man at the second coming of Christ and every woman. Everyone will be judged depending on whether they have confessed their sins and allowed the righteousness of Christ to be counted to their record, or if they have rebelled against God and refused Jesus' offer of atonement. To those who refuse, their entire record of sin stands against them. To those who have submitted their records to Jesus Christ, it simply says the name of Jesus Christ covers it all. Amen. So you and I don't have anything to be afraid of. We just simply submit our lives to Jesus, and Jesus takes care of it all. But the Bible makes it clear that there's a real record, and there is real challenge to those who decide not to accept Jesus as their Savior. Not because God wants to scare us, but because sin is deadly. Cancer is deadly. When you go to the doctor and you find out you've got cancer, you want the doctor to say, I'm going to help you get rid of that. When you go to Jesus and he tells you you've got a sin problem and then he says, oh, by the way, sin's deadly. If you don't get rid of it, you're going to lose out on eternal life. You want him to say, oh, I've got a solution to that problem. And Jesus does that. He says, I've got a solution to the problem. The solution is me. Amen. And all you have to do is accept my forgiveness. That's it. Amen. God takes it from there. And he works in our lives. Judgment is not just about looking at what men and women have done. It is also even more than that. It is the hour of His or God's judgment. And the reason for that is because God is also being judged by what's going on in this world. Millennia ago in heaven, according to the Bible, angels led by Lucifer, we call him Satan today, rebelled against God. God had given him these angels the power of choice. They challenge the authority and government of God. By the way, Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9 tells you that story if you want to go there, but I just want you to know it's there. They challenge the authority of the government of God. There was actually war in heaven. Lucifer said God is unfair, God is unjust, God is a vindictive tyrant, God is a wrathful judge. There was rebellion in heaven and it introduced into the universe a question about God's character, whether he was fair, whether he could be trusted, and questioned his integrity. So this judgment in Revelation is not just about you and me, it's also about vindicating God 
And that's why he sent Jesus here. Because Jesus is the clearest evidence that God is fair. As fair as anybody could ever be. This judgment that Revelation describes is not because God does not know who is going to be saved or lost. It's because God is so fair and just that he opens the records of human lives before the whole universe so that all can see that everybody who is lost is lost because of their own decisions. And it also, God wants us to know that those who are saved are saved because they accepted Jesus. Amen. You know what? You and I get to heaven one day, I might find there's somebody there I didn't think would ever be there. But I also might find that there's some people not there that I thought would be there. Ooh, right. And God wants me to be able to know that because He does not just simply erase our minds and our memories. If He could do that, He could just do that now and we wouldn't have a problem. The major theme of the book of Revelation is a conflict between Christ and Satan. The final judgment revolves around this conflict and then it reveals the truth. And Satan is exposed as a liar. Jesus said to his disciples one day, he said, uh, Satan is the father of lies. Well, he is, and he's going to be exposed as such. God reveals in the judgment that he has done everything he can to save, and Satan has done everything he can to destroy. Anybody that is lost is lost because God didn't, not because God pointed his finger and said, you're lost, it's because of their decisions and their choices, and they are lost because they rejected his grace. Revelation reveals many details about God's work of judgment, but we need to ask the question, where does this judgment take place? Is it on earth, or is it in heaven? The book of Revelation describes the vivid scenes of the power of God's judgment, but to discover where and when the judgment begins, we need to look briefly at the book of Daniel. We turn back to the prophetic book of Daniel, and in Daniel we see unlocking there the mysteries that help us to understand Revelation. Those two books, Daniel and Revelation, are meant to be studied together. When you compare Daniel chapter 7 with Revelation chapter 13, you see a clear link because the same beasts are spoken of there. We don't have time to go into that tonight, but I just want you to see the two books are clearly tied together. In the seventh chapter of Daniel, the prophet describes looking up into heaven, and he writes these incredible words. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. And thousands, thousands ministered to him, ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were open. You don't need to go and have nightmares about this kind of thing. This is a picture of God taking the world back under his control. Amen. Satan has got control of this world. That's why people are dying left and right all over. That's why there are terrible disasters all over. It's not because of God. God didn't create this problem. Satan created this problem. Amen. And it's time that God get his just due. Satan needs to get his just due. Amen. The books will be opened and these things will be brought to light. The court will be seated and the answer to where the judgment is taking place is in heaven. When does it take place? According to what we've already looked at, it has already started. It has to start before the second coming. Stop and think about it. Before Jesus can come back, he has to know who's ready. It's not that he needs to know, but we all need to be ready to see it and understand. The judgment must settle everything before Jesus comes back. If the judgment has already started before the second coming, and if the signs of the times tell us that the second coming is near, then the question is, could it be that the judgment in heaven has already begun? I'm just asking again to make us think this carefully through. Could it be that when Christ descends, the judgment will have already finished, and those that are resurrected and caught up to meet Christ in the air have been declared in the judgment righteous through Jesus? They've been saved by the blood of the Lamb. Could it be that those who are destroyed by the brightness of Christ's coming, those who are ultimately and eternally lost, have had their fate decided by their own choices 
and reveal in the judgment. Does Daniel tell us when the judgment will take place? In chapter 8 of verse 14, and verse 14, we read the date was there. 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Starting the reference up there is not correct. That should be Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. The prophecy tells us that the sanctuary would be cleansed. What is the cleansing? It is the judgment. I'd like to summarize for you tonight this information and help you and me to realize that both of